Good evening. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, December 14th, 2020 at 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide a public comment by calling 630-743-4085 and recording their comment. Comments will be accepted until we reach the public comment portion of the agenda. We will play all comments submitted remotely in the order in which they were received. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment tonight. We're going to start off with Fairmount School, so I'd like to welcome uh, Principal Nef Nefratos. I know James just went to grab her. Might be worthwhile unlocking that door. <laughs> to go all the way around. Good evening, welcome. Good evening. Thank you guys for having us today. So my name is Lisa Nefratis. I'm the principal at Fairmount School. This is simply going to be a very different presentation than what we've done in years past. What we're hoping from today is that we've captured um, the students, the staff, and our PTA all into one nice package so that you guys can see that and represent what's being done in this school. So we're starting today with the flag salute. <clears throat> Pledge allegiance to the flag. Uh, gonna do it. Oh, gonna do it. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. So the flag salute today was brought to you by the first graders in Miss Maselli's class and the fifth graders in Miss Breka and Miss Matson's class. Mm. And we're going to move into our PTA president, Dominic Zuccaro, who is new to our PTA this year. And he has prepared a little presentation for you guys this evening. Hi there, Dominic Zuccaro, PTA president from Fairmont Elementary. Uh, this year does look a little different. Uh, and, you know, we're bringing up some challenges, obviously, with what we're dealing with. Uh, but there are a few things that we have done this year that we're proud of uh, and some things that we have planned uh, coming up uh, in, in the future months uh, for this year. So first off, uh, we gifted uh, the PTA membership this year to all Fairmount families. Uh, we felt like this was a nice little gesture uh, just to let the families know uh, for the um, upcoming school year that their PTA fees would be paid for uh, by the PTA. Uh, another thing we did is we sent out uh, signs uh, to all the new families that were coming in uh, to Fairmount this year. So every new family got us a free sign uh, that said, you know, proud to be a Fairmount Falcon. And then we also did uh, a Fairmount Falcon sign sale along with mask sales uh, to the other Fairmount families as a fundraiser. Uh, we did purchase stand-up desks uh, as well uh, for the teachers to help facilitate remote learning. Uh, and then also we have a hat and glove drive uh, that is coming up uh, here in the month of December uh, to donate uh, brand new hats and gloves uh, to children in need uh, in the Downers Grove area. And then one of our fun lunch partners, Home Run and Pizza, uh, we partnered with them uh, to do a take and bake uh, pizza fundraiser uh, as well. Uh, so some, those are some of the new things that we have done this year, uh, you know, because of the year looking a little different, uh, but also uh, we did some things that we normally do every single year, some more traditional things. Uh, like when school first started, we did do our chalk the walk. So the teachers were greeted with uh, the sidewalks chalked up and the welcome back and uh, the motto for go the distance uh, as well. We also did the welcome back breakfast for the teachers. The PTA offered up and, and paid for the welcome back uh, breakfast. Uh, and then coming up uh, in this year as well, a couple of the programs that we're going to continue to do uh, because they are a little easier to do, uh, especially in a virtual uh, setting, is we will be doing our virtual STEM night. Uh, so we're going to keep that going, so that'll be later in the year. And we're going to continue with the One Book, One School uh, program, and we're in the process right now of choosing what that book is going to be. 
So this year is definitely different, uh, but we are definitely trying to make um, an impact and try to make it as fun as possible for the kids. So we thank again Mr. Zucchero for his leadership in taking on that big responsibility this year and really all their efforts that they're doing just to make this year as normal and as involved for the students as possible. The next piece that you're going to see is emphasizing the teaching and learning that's being done at Fairmount, not only in support of our school improvement plan, but also the tie-in and connection to the district strategic plan. And again, done in this format so that you can have a lens into learning at the same time. During the month of October, the students at Fairmount engaged in the NWA MAP testing in both math and reading remotely. Fairmount's median percentile in the area of reading was at the 77th percentile and at the 67th percentile in math. In support of District 58's strategic plan and Fairmount's school improvement plan, we are working collaboratively towards reaching the district's strategic plan targets of the 80th percentile and the 77th percentile, respectively. In continuously working toward improving teaching and learning, students, whether they are in a hybrid or remote learning setting, are targeting skills such as understanding and utilizing figurative language and literary devices in both their reading and writing. Additionally, and through our ELA benchmark and study sync curriculum, students in the intermediate grades continue to further develop their annotating skills to deepen their total understanding of both informational and fiction texts. Our primary students focus a great deal on skills such as understanding the organization of print concepts along with syllables and sounds. They are also furthering their knowledge of text by working toward developing their ability to identify key ideas and details in informational reads throughout their day. Both Bridges and Big Ideas are new to all students in Downers Grove District 58. And with these new programs comes a shift in our instructional approach. Even at a time when instruction looks much different, students in the Bridges program, whether on-site or remote, have access to individual student manipulative kits. These have proven to be a powerful way for students to grow in their conceptual understanding as well as offer a hands-on approach to learning. These, along with number corners and workplaces, have further enhanced the learning being done and through the preparations and practice of our teachers, students are receiving the instructional variety that is essential to further developing and understanding mathematical skills. So again, whether the students are currently learning in a hybrid model or in a remote model, I think the staff the teachers and the students alike have really done a nice job adjusting. And this next part is actually going to feature remote learning. We have seven, in the current model, we have seven remote teachers at Fairmount that are servicing both Fairmount and some other school, uh, schools as well. So hopefully you'll enjoy the highlight on remote learning. Again, that's a little bit harder to capture, even from an administrative perspective, to really see what's going on. So I hope this provides a nice lens into the remote learning. While we currently have many of our students on site in a hybrid learning model at Fairmount, at some point during the first half of the school year, all teachers have taught and all students have learned in a remote setting. The photos you are currently seeing are just some of the amazing moments that have been captured in a remote learning setting. While our students, staff, and families certainly put forth amazing efforts in the spring of 2020 during the mandated school closure, the remote classroom of this spring versus the remote classroom of this school year are truly unrecognizable. Even our youngest students have learned how to log onto Zoom independently, co-facilitate breakout rooms, share their screens, and much, much more. In our current learning plan, Fairmount has seven remote teachers who teach a remote class for his or her morning or afternoon session. While we certainly would not have anticipated we would be instructing elementary students in a remote setting, our teachers have collaborated, planned, and truly pounded pavement to ensure that whether we are in a permanent or temporary remote setting, students are getting the most out of their learning session and, to the greatest extent possible, mimicking a student's on-site learning experience. The Fairmount remote teachers have found that through the use of breakout rooms, they can mirror the differentiation and collaboration opportunities they would have done in a more typical school year. Remote teachers have also shared that students who typically would not be as active in regards to volunteering 
and sharing insight are more vocal and comfortable on Zoom. While we recognize this is not true for everyone, this is a unique opportunity to build upon those skills and assist our students with transferring that skill set when they return to on-site learning. A few remote teachers also shared that their students are truly doing things that they did not believe they were capable of, and in a typical school year, they would not have necessarily had them try. Additionally, the remote teachers at Fairmount and across the district have found unique ways to bring important activities to the virtual classroom. Our second grade remote teacher, for example, recently initiated the Compliments Project, which has been completed previously on site. Through the use of Seesaw, students are able to complete this meaningful project and further develop their SEL skills and thinking in the process. Teachers, whether remote or hybrid, are also finding unique ways to capture the curriculum or celebrations in a virtual setting when it cannot be conducted in the classroom. Our kindergarten students took a virtual field trip to various farms during science, and let's not forget the importance of integrating some fun on class, grade level, and school-wide spirit days. Our teachers are also receiving a majority of their learning and professional development, including articulation and school-based planning through Zoom due to current guidelines. I am truly in awe of what all of our teachers are accomplishing and thankful that even in the toughest of moments, we come together, we laugh, we smile. The last few slides, or obviously the last one in particular, is really some of my favorites, but even if you capture those last three, teachers of course are going out of their way to deliver the curriculum and like we said, mirror that on-site experience to the best of their capabilities, but they're also going above and beyond and really making sure that they capture those spirited moments, that we have a little fun built into our day and that the students then remember not only why they're learning, but the importance of really connecting with their teachers and the students alike too. And obviously the teachers need to remember, and they brought tears to my eyes in a way of laughing that day because they decided to use some of their Zoom tools that they had been perfecting as well by adding hats and whatnot. So <laughs> um, the last thing that you're going to see today is actually a new committee involving our most important stakeholders, in my opinion, that we're bringing to Fairmount this year. Over the course of the last few years at Fairmount, we have prioritized communication and partnership with all school stakeholders. We have increased our school-to-home communication through our Fairmount Families Weekend Report, offered a lens into learning through Twitter and Seesaw, and have further fostered engagement and partnership through the use of positive parent contacts, positive office referrals, and through the work of both our BLT and SFC committee. In addition to the 2020-2021 school year is the initiation of a student advisory committee. During the month of November, students in both 5th and 6th grade had the opportunity to complete an interest form regarding their participation in this student-centered committee. All students who completed the interest form were asked to complete either a short video or written response encompassing the why behind their interest, the what they could bring to the committee, and or what they feel is the best part about Fairmount. While this is certainly an unfamiliar year to us all, it is just as, if not more important, to keep students interested and engaged in their school community. Students interested in the committee still have some time to submit their videos and responses, but here is a snapshot of the submissions for our new Student Advisory Committee at Fairmount and School. This committee is like, we're going to give new ideas from the kids' point of view, so like our point of view that sometimes the teachers don't get to hear about. I love Fairmount, like, a lot. I want to make Fairmount the Fairmountiest that I can. It's been so hard because we're not all together at school. I would like to do what I can through the committee to help us feel like one big Fairmount family. Some of my favorite things about Fairmount are having kind teachers that are always have your back, having awesome classmates and friends, having some really fun fundraisers and assemblies. More spirit days to help lift our moods during these tough times because I don't know about you, but I sure laughed during crazy outfit day. Man, we went all out. I have a lot to contribute to Fairmount. I will bring a positive attitude and ideas for how to make the school better. 
I will also ask other students for their ideas. And love going to school at Fairmount. I enjoy sharing my opinion, and listening to others is important too. Thank you for considering me for the position. That's Lydia Larson. Up. really looking forward to starting this committee and I think as a personal reflection I was delaying it I was like no we need to wait for something to change I need to wait for me to be able to work with these students in person but I realized they have the ideas they're used to meeting on zoom they're going to be the change so we stopped delaying the change and we're gonna start up in January so thank you guys so much for letting me speak this evening well, thank, thank you so thank much you. for being here uh, we really really appreciate it and uh, this is one of the things that we've missed. We've only got to do one of these so far this year besides yours. So it's so great to get that snapshot into the building. So we appreciate you being here tonight. And I'm excited to hear about what the uh, Student Advisory Committee is going to do. It was, it was really great to hear from your students. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. All right, first non-action item report is um, a recognition of our students for the Illinois Music Educators Association. The Illinois Music Education Association, or the ILMEA, selected 41 District 58 students to participate in a virtual fall festival master class day in November. This event replaced ILMEA's usual in-person music and jazz performance festival due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Congratulations to our outstanding District 58 musicians. All right, next up we have a spotlight on our school. It's the audit report, so I'd like to introduce Todd Drayfall. And I will introduce uh, Betsy, who is here from Miller Cooper, uh, our audit firm, um, the district's audit firm. Uh, they have uh, finished the independent uh, audit uh, it is in your packet, and um, we'll briefly go over some of the things um, that, you know, of the highlights of this year and of the fiscal year 20. And, um, and there's a, a management report we can talk about a little bit. Uh, fortunately, there's no repeat items, uh, just a few things to work on uh, for the next year. Hello. Good evening. I know this will be the highlight of your meeting, so I will try to keep it short and sweet. And, um, but if you have any questions um, as I'm going through, please don't hesitate um, to stop me, and I will answer them or answer anything um, at the end. Um, I'm just quickly going to go through the financials, just the different sections. I'm um, not going to get into a lot of the numbers, as you know, those are June 30th numbers, and I'm sure you get a financial update um, every month from Todd. Um, but I do want to start by thanking Todd and his entire staff. Um, you know, for all their hard work during this audit. You know, in these times it was done a bit differently. We did most of the audit remotely. Uh, we went in a couple days, or my, the t my team did, um, just to look at some documents, mostly I believe probably like um, personnel files that really we didn't want to have uploaded um, to our smart sheet. So again, I just really want to thank Todd and his entire staff for, you know, making this process run smoothly, um, even though, you know, a lot of it was done, was done remotely. So thank you, Todd. Um, the first document you have um, is the um, is about is about the financial statements um, of the district the annual financial report on page one is the independent auditors report again this year it is an unmodified clean opinion which is the highest level of assurance that we can give um, as auditors on pages 5 through 12 of the report is the management discussion and analysis um, this is prepared by the district and reviewed by us um, I'm sure if you've been to been on the board before you've heard me say this is a great document to read if you just want a sort of a snapshot of what's in the rest of the document um, it talks about some financial highlights it also describes all the and describes the um, financial statements that are presented in the document there's condensed financial statements and there's also a, um, an area on there of things that could have some financial effects or financial burdens um, on the district in future years On pages 13 through 21 is what we refer to as our basic financial statements. Uh, pages 13 and 14 are the government-wide financial statements. Uh, the main difference between the government-wide and the fund ones that we'll look at quickly is you'll, the main difference is you'll see all the debt 
the long-term liabilities and all the capital assets of the district um, on the statement of net position. I do want to point out um, on page 13 in the long-term liabilities, the district does have about $63.5 million of long-term liabilities reported. But remember that the majority of that, all but about 11.2 million, are the pension liabilities and the other post-employment benefit liabilities, you know, that are determined actuarially and are not due next year. You know, they're long-term liabilities. So there's only about 11.2 million of that number um, that are the bonds and the capital leases um, of the district. Uh, page 15 is where you'll see the fund financial statements, which will be the statements you're more used to seeing on a monthly basis. Here I just want to point out on the general fund, that does include your ed and your working cash fund, um, and our combining statements uh, farther back um, in the report. The district did end the year with about a $26 million uh, fund balance, which is about an increase of about $2.5 million from the prior year. Uh, pages 22 through 67 are the notes to the financial statements. Uh, this is where you'll find a lot of detailed information um, to better understand the numbers that are reported within the financial statements um, that we just looked at. There's information on the summary of significant accounting policies. There's uh, more detailed information on the debt of the district um, and the capital assets. And there's a number of pages um, that you'll see on the pension liabilities for um, TRS and IMRF and the other post-employment benefits um, with THIS and the retiree health plan um, of the district. Um, the remaining parts of the report are the required supplementary information and the supplementary financial information. Uh, th this section has a lot of multi-year schedules um, that again um, show the contributions and the pension liabilities and OPEB liabilities. There's also budgetary statements um, for each fund that is reported by the district which show the current year budget along with um, the current year actual and the prior year actual for comparison purposes. Um, the final sections um, which start on page 102 will discuss um, have the combining schedules for the ed and the working cash one that we discussed and also a schedule of the changes of the student activity funds and the activity by each by each school. And then the, to round out the end of the report, um, there is some other supplemental information, which contains the bond repayment schedules by bond issue, which starts on page 110. And there's also the computation of the other post, um, I'm sorry, the um, tuition charge per pupil and the operating expense per pupil, which is a, um, a computation done in the annual financial report that is submitted with the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, we, we also issued, um, and Todd had already referred to this, um, our, ma our management letter, our control deficiency letter. Um, we did just have two minor, um, minor issues that we reported on here, and you've seen the letter, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer anything on those. I said, Todd, you had mentioned, it sounds like you've already discussed those um, with the committee, and we will continue to work with the district um, to make sure it, they are not there next year. Um, and then lastly, we issued our required communication to the board letter. Um, this is where it states that we've done our audit in accordance with accounting principles, uh, generally except in the United States of America. We also have done it in accordance with government auditing standards, which is required by the Illinois State Board of Education, as well as uniform guidance, um, as the district had needed a single audit because they expended over 750,000 of federal funds. Uh, page two of this letter um, discusses any new GASB statements. And GASB is a governmental accounting standards board. Um, any of that were to be implemented or be implemented in future years. Uh, GASB did um, issue statement 95, which postponed the implementation of any GASB statement this year um, due to the pandemic and to, you know, give, to give government some, you know, um, some relief, you know, with other things going on. So next year we will implement GASB 84 for the reporting of fiduciary activities. Um, and so we will work again. We talked about this last year with Todd uh, to get that one implemented in fiscal year 21. Um, we did also in this letter on page five and within the notes of the financial statements, we did add a, a significant financial statement disclosure, you know, on COVID-19 and on the pandemic. Um, really, it's a general statement to sort of um, 
showing some effects of property tax collections due to the the county allowing different rules for paying property taxes you know and investments could have different um, interest rates so we just put a very general um, statement within the financial statements just on the effects that it could have on the district and then again when we released the reports on december 10th um, the, uh, the superintendent and todd both signed our management representation letter and all these documents have been filed um, with the appropriate agencies. So does anyone have any questions? Any questions, comments? No? Thank you so much. We Thank really you. appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. T take care and happy happy holidays. Same you Thank too. You. Thank you. And uh, thanks again, Todd. This is, you know, the... Uh, Relatively clean bill of health. Uh, we appreciate that as a board for sure. And we can talk a little bit when I, I give my my report in a few minutes. Um, you know, you um, you do accept the audit. Uh, you know, it's not an approval process, um, but accepting it and then um, you know the two the, the things on the activity funds. That's a new piece for this year, and that's something we'll be working with the buildings on uh, and making sure that <coughs> those are those are adjusted. So, and we'll be back in a little while. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, sir. All right, our next report is going to be uh, an update on the District 58 learning model. So, uh, Justin Sissel and Dr. Russell. Welcome back. So thank you for allowing us to talk about uh, feedback we've received on our instructional model. As we committed way back when in September, which feels like a very long time ago, but it really wasn't, um, we committed to making sure that we get feedback from our families and then doing a thorough review from our families and also our staff prior to coming to the board in January with any recommendations for enhancements to the program. So the objectives for tonight, we hope to review the process that we use to get this feedback and, and how we're analyzing the survey results. We want to discuss the next steps with you and move uh, toward a thorough conversation. Um, now, today's objective is not to provide that full analysis of, of everything that we've received. And there are a couple of reasons for that. That's really what we're intending to do at the January meeting. We have gotten a lot of information from families, but we're still in the process of gathering information from staff, including several meetings that we have this week. So. Today's purpose is to talk more about the process, what kind of questions we're asking, what we're looking for to get some feedback from the board on that, and then we'll move forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Justin. Justin's gonna take you through the presentation and I'll sum it up at the end. Good evening. So as you are aware, there were surveys developed both for staff in District 58 and for families, similar but not same, and those surveys were available for a week uh, between November 23rd and 30th. In those surveys, we asked a number of questions. We asked some, some quantitative questions around effectiveness and manageability of the instructional models that have been in place thus far this year. Those questions were driven by your answer on the survey in terms of grade level, because different grade levels have experienced different models, depending, and also our specialized programs have experienced some different instructional models. And so we asked families to fill the survey out once per student in the household, as if they were willing to do that. We asked about the, the impact of the changes that have happened over the course of the year, and then we asked a number of open-ended questions, most generally, it, what are the positive aspects of this instructional model or that instructional model, and what are things you might hope to see improved in, in the same way. We received um, just about, just close to 2,000 individual responses from staff and families combined, which because of the construction of the survey yielded 7,032 open-ended responses. And so that is really the, you know, the charts tell you something, but the open-ended responses are really where you can glean a lot of perspective. And that is the, the time we are taking over the course of this month to really work through those responses. Just to review what's happened thus far, after the surveys closed on November 30th, the ASC team began initial data review, and the first thing we wanted to do was take just sort of an initial look at the information, and I'll talk a bit more about that process in the next slides. 
We did that with the administrative team on December 2nd with a volunteer working group on the 3rd. Over the course of the following week, we synthesized the work of that first week, preparing for the opportunity just this past Friday for all certified staff and instructional assistants to have an opportunity to talk through some of the initial, um, I don't want to say findings, some of the initial themes that emerged through the data. Um, and then obviously we're here tonight first talking about this to the board and the community. That initial review, again, we used our administrative team, which is our building principals, assistant principals, and coordinators. That was one activity or one set of meetings. We also opened up to all certified staff an invitation to join us for that initial review. We had 25 uh, certified staff volunteer, another number of building administrators volunteered, and then we did have some of the ASC team within that group as well. In both of those activities, because there is so much data and we wanted to make sure that we got, we, we did review everything thoroughly, we asked, we broke them into smaller groups and asked groups to focus on a subset by, by grade level or looking at family and staff data to really make sure that across those meetings and across 10 subgroups within those two larger groups, we were able to see everything. And as we mentioned before, the central office team is reviewing and re-reviewing all 7,000 of those responses as well. The way those initial review meetings worked, you know, we put forth the purpose of really to just look at what we are seeing and what the data is telling us, know, and what the feedback is telling us, knowing that we would find things that aligned with our personal experiences and we would find things that were completely the opposite of our personal experiences. And that's why this process wasn't about trying to draw conclusions in any sense. This was about trying to identify themes and, and to differentiate between the comment or two that really resonated with you in one way or another versus the, the, the comments and threads that were continuous and, and reoccurring through the feedback so we could really get to what are the things that we next need to work through. To give you an idea of how we structured those meetings, these are pulled right from the meeting agendas. These are the guiding questions that we asked both the administrative group and the working group to, to process. And the first was really to look at themes and trends, both from the graphs and charts and from the open-ended responses, a little more guidance with some of those questions. and then. Really, what, are the, what other questions come up? You know, again, we weren't looking for conclusions necessarily. We were looking for what does this tell us we need to further explore. From there, we knew that we were going to take some time this past Friday for all staff to have conversations. But again, we knew that all staff wouldn't be able to parse through 7,000 responses. So the goal was to come up with some focused discussion prompts based upon that initial review. And so that was the sort of the final task of the initial survey group to really think about are there, are there things that we want to consider changing? Are there things that we don't want to lose no matter what happens? And, and where do we go from here? What are the, not what are the things we have to implement, but what are the next conversations we need to have so that we can continue to make sure we're hearing all of our, of our staff voices and really digesting all of the family input as we make these decisions. So from there, this past Friday, we had small group conversations at each of our 13 buildings, rather than a large faculty meeting that would allow for maybe more time, but a more challenging structure to, to work with 30 and 40 and 50 people, especially via Zoom. We, we structured it so the groups were around 10, less in some cases, slightly more in some cases, and facilitated by the building administrators. Um, we worked as a team to really develop a consistent set of questions, a consistent frame for the activity, and the, the topics that were discussed which are not all inclusive, but were the things that really did rise to the surface of we need to talk more about this with staff. We talked about the temporarily remote students, the students who are under mandatory quarantine and looking at the processes we do have in place and what could be some other possibilities, are there ways to enhance that, are there ways to maintain consistency without necessarily making that shift. Right now, the option is to move into another classroom with another teacher. We did discuss the idea of could we explore in this very limited instance, could we explore a little bit of concurrent teaching where that student might have an opportunity to zoom into their classroom during a temporary quarantine and what would that look like and what would the impact be on staff and what would we need to know about that so that was a, a discussion question for Friday we talked about the the need to maintain the ability to move between our hybrid instructional model and the potential for an adaptive pause that could put us into a fully remote scenario but also recognizing that we want to make sure we are providing the very best instructional opportunities that we can within each of those models Certainly we know the flexibility that's needed. We know the constraints on, on physically having students in the classroom and that's uh, especially at the elementary level. That has a lot to do with why we are in the structure we're in. We also know that the survey did give us some indication that the, the September remote model 
had some advantages for, for families and for staff. And so we want to make sure that staff had a chance to talk through the ways to try to make sure we're bringing the best of both worlds together. Survey data also told us that there are, people are, are struggling in general and specifically. There are families who are struggling, there are students who are struggling, there are staff members who are struggling. And, and, and we actually, we appreciate getting that feedback in the way that we received it. So in order to, to recognize and honor that, that was another part of the conversation on Friday. What are the things that we've put in place to support families, to support students, and to support our staff members and each other, what are those things that have worked well for us already and how do we build upon those? How do we continue to, in whatever may come next, how do we keep the things that are making this more manageable for everyone? And then we also talked about the check-in time that was used during the um, adaptive pause. We talked a little bit at the middle school about remote engagement strategies. And obviously within all of this, there are going to be some tangential conversations that occur as well. But those are the major topics that the initial uh, review of the survey feedback brought forth. And then those are the topics that were used for conversation on Friday across the district. Things that weren't necessarily discussed on Friday, but have emerged through survey data review. There is certainly a, a sense of the strength of maintaining current teachers whenever possible. That comes from families, that comes from staff. You know, at this point we are further into the year than we had been and so certainly there's a desire to make, have that consistency when we can. There's also an expressed value in the synchronous instruction and the amount of time. Certainly families, a number of them expressed the desire to see more of that live instruction. Staff expressed the, the, the reality that in the, cur the current model is constraining with the amount of time we are able to provide live instruction. We're making the best of every minute we can, but there are things that we, we know we can't do. And so that's another conversation that is you know, on the horizon as well. There were also a number of questions about what will that recommitment process look like and, and what will it mean and again, what will the impact of that change be? With an acknowledgement in many conversations that since October when we began the hybrid model, there have been a number of families who have asked to amend their commitment and move into fully remote instruction and that has over time caused some, some less balanced classes than we began with. And so as we look forward, that will be another part of conversation and obviously a continued emphasis on health and safety protocols and making sure that we are continuing to be in complete compliance with all of those things. So again, these were other elements that came out of survey, survey review that were not discussed formally on Friday with all staff, but are part of future discussions. So as we talk about the next steps, and uh, it sounds crazy, but over the next month, but that'll be the next time we see everyone is at the uh, 11th in, of, of January at our next meeting. We've got a lot of data to pour through from last Friday from our uh, staff. The 15th is an important day because that's when we're gonna get that working group of staff back together with um, Justin and James and Jessica and really start to dive into some of that data that we got on the um, uh, 11th last week. December 17th is also a very important date. That's this Thursday when we'll get back all of our building leaders and really have that good conversation about their recommendations on our next steps. Winter break is gonna be a time where the ASC team We'll be working um, you know, to, to put that presentation together for the Board of Education and some recommended changes. And then again, we'll come back to you on the 11th and, and try and pull all this together and talk about what it can look like uh, moving forward. And uh, that will be no small task because as we look at the spring, there's a lot of unknowns about the spring and, and the impact of a vaccine or will these numbers stay where they're at. And so there's a lot to consider as we move forward. But one of the things that we are keenly aware of in any school year is the impact of change, but especially this year, the impact of change. And so really talking through that and what makes sense and uh, we'll come back in January and present that to you. So with that, that concludes our presentation. Um, I know Justin emphasized that that uh, family survey will be uh, placed on the uh, district's website through board docs. So everybody will have a chance to uh, look at that data, the same data that we have. Um, Transparency is extremely important to us and we want to make sure that we get that out there for all of our families to review. Um, and is it going to, I'm sorry, you say on board docs, but normally there's, is it going to be on the website under? Yeah, I kind of combine them too. So you'll see it not only in board docs, but also on the survey or section the of our survey. website. Because then that's where all the other ones are. So we'd like, Correct. okay, okay, Correct. just making sure. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Every time we've um, made a decision as a board, and we've, at, throughout this process, one of my questions has always been, you know, where's, where's the accountability? Um, that's what I'm always interested in, interested in is that accountability piece. My question usually is, how are we going to gather feedback? How are we going to um, look at data? 
Um, understanding that whatever, whatever system we put into place, it's going to have opportunities. We're, we're going to be able to make it better. So how are we going to t take that feedback and, and be continuously, continuously improving that model? So I appreciate this, um, this presentation and the work you've done, and I appreciate the, uh, the input of, of our entire staff and our community. Um, we've often said that this is, um, it's, it's very, very difficult throughout this to, 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 to um, put together a, a model that's going to overwhelm people with happiness, but we, the, the best we can do is put something there that makes the most sense at that time and then continuously work to get it fine-tuned, make it better, make improvements, and I really appreciate this work, so thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Anybody else? The only thing I want to mention is um, one of the things that I was I've kind of been banging on the desk about since this summer, right, is continuity. So if we're going to do any tweaks or anything um, going into January based on, on people's reaction and, and shifts and stuff that they may want to make, I'm really going to be looking at that continuity and, and to know where our limitations might be. Like if the continuity arc would be um, all the way from fully remote into hybrid, expanded hybrid, and then into a full day environment. I'm not saying that we'll be able to go all the way from the left all the way to the right in this calendar year, but I'd like to know, is it possible? Is it not possible? What do, what do those limitations look like? And what would be the, you know, the impact on the day? For example, if we went to that expanded hybrid, that would most likely, I'm assuming, merge kind of the AM and PM groups together and shift them down to like a long morning. Well, what kind of notice would we give? Because that could impact um, how kids get back to it. So those are the kind of things I'm just going to be looking for to kind of kind of see any, anything that we're doing, how does that impact our continuity and ability to react to what's going on so that we can provide what's best for our students and our staff and our families. So that's what I'd be looking for in, in January. Thank you. I'll actually, I wanted to make a comment. I, I forgot to mention it, but your point brought it up for me, Darren. Uh, this is the last time we'll meet before families and students come back from winter break. Mm -hmm. And uh, just go, if you can give us a lens into what can we anticipate in terms of communication uh, or what the return to learn will look like, whether it is continuous from what we're already experiencing or not, uh, what kind of advance notice will, will families be getting and what preview will you be providing the board in advance of that? Yeah, so I'm going to answer that in, 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 in two ways. The, the first way I'm going to answer that is um, whether or not we're going to be back on, let's say, the 5th after that Institute Day. And then in terms of any of this model changing, I don't think our families should anticipate any kind of a change to the current model until after the January 11th board meeting. And then we would lay out a time frame for what those changes would look like and what the recommitment process would look like in terms of a family picking on-site or um, you know, full remote learning. But coming back to a window into the fifth, we are in this bi-weekly communication to our families about every two weeks. Obviously, if we did that, that communication would come out on Monday in terms of whether or not we're going to be able to come back for in-person on the fifth. So what we've committed to in our families is making that communication um, on this Friday ahead of winter break. We don't want to do a communication over winter break when people might not be you know, checking everything or have regular access to their uh, emails. What we're looking for is, you know, obviously the default is always we want to be in person and offer the full uh, remote option. At this particular point, what we're doing right now is we're reviewing the data in terms of what did it look like after Thanksgiving? Did we experience a post-Thanksgiving bump? How many students did we see switch their preference because families weren't comfortable sending their children back? What was the disruption to the educational process, if there was one, and going through all of that? So as we do that, we would make that recommendation on Friday and send that out to um, families in terms of the day that we're, we're coming back. So right now we're scheduled to come back on the 5th. If there were to be any kind of change um, or no change, we would communicate that out this Friday to uh, families. But I just wanted to give you a window into some of the things that we're considering as we um, make that change. What we've seen in terms of the data and the transmission levels is things have improved since um, you know November, uh, but they're staying steady at, at that kind of higher rate, but we're not seeing the transmission uh, in our schools, the substitute situation, which I'll talk about in the superintendent's report, has improved drastically in our schools. But um, Friday, we would send out a communication and let our families know. 
with a caveat though, and I always have to say this, anything can happen over those two weeks in winter break. And so we would, it, you know, if something happened, we would obviously, you know, reserve the right to change that decision, but we really don't want to do that. Once we tell families that in staff, this is what's going to happen. We, we really don't want to change it unless there's a very good reason to do so. Thank you. Thanks. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are 17 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communication board members would like to share at this time? All right, then we'll kick it off with the superintendent's report. Thank you very much. Um, before I start the superintendent's report, I, I just want to pause and, and thank our families and staff for all of the feedback. We have um, been so thankful for all the feedback um, that we've received, and some of it's uh, constructive, some of it's positive, but to know that our staff and our community care that much is, is very um, you know, encouraging for me as the superintendent and our team. It causes us to work harder knowing just how committed our families are. So we want to thank everyone and especially our staff for doing that as well. On Monday, January 4th, we have a Teachers Institute Day. So that is a scheduled uh, non-attendance day. Uh, it's included in our calendar. On that day, all certified staff will attend six one-hour sessions of professional learning with over 100 different sessions to choose from. So the emphasis is really on differentiation, uh, asking our staff what they want and then how we deliver that. Certain sessions are required for staff members depending on their role, but all also have an opportunity to select sessions that will best meet their professional learning needs from a variety of offerings. So we're very excited about the Institute Day and I wanna thank all of our staff members and administrators for uh, conducting sessions on that day to help offer all those differentiated experiences. In terms of finance, uh, the tax levy, which is always a, a thing we discuss in December, the tax levy previously approved by the Board of Education has been received by the uh, DuPage County Clerk's Office. By law, the board must file the tax levy by the last Tuesday in December. Thank you to our entire business office for making sure that this was done well in advance. In terms of facilities, we have two updates. Uh, for those of you who have been through the El Sierra neighborhood, uh, with final approvals and paperwork received from the state, construction permission was approved by the district. The awarded contractor was available and, and, and they've started. Uh, demolition and general excavation started uh, last week along with the delivery of the playground equipment. The contractor's exact work schedule will be dependent on winter weather, but they anticipate the entire job finished by the middle of May. I will tell you I was there on Saturday. If this weather continues, I think that date will be moved up. Uh, but of course, we don't want to guarantee anything, but we know that we've got some uh, constituents, especially those five and six year olds over at LCR that want that playground done. And so we are uh, keeping that in, in, in consideration as we move forward. Um, we did have a significant uh, water leak at Herrick in uh, the hot water pipes that we used to uh, heat the building. <coughs> Two weeks ago, uh, there was that significant water leak at Herrick that caused problems with how the building was heated. The water that leaked from the pipe caused the elevator shaft to flood and significant repairs were needed. Uh, crews worked around the clock. Uh, the pipe that leaked was an original pipe from when the school was built that was severely damaged through normal wear and tear of just the age of the pipe. I do want to thank our B&G team for all their hard work uh, so the school did not have to be uh, shut down. We were able to open up the next day, but it did take 24 hours working around the clock to do that. The reason I bring this up is we have water leaks and all that stuff throughout all of our buildings. Uh, but I can tell you being in that uh, room at Herrick and looking at that water pipe, and I know the board have seen uh, the pictures of that. There are significant issues, and um, you know that as a Board of Education, but I, I do want to let the community know this is why the facility conversation, as soon as we round the corner with COVID-19, has to take front and center again uh, because all of those issues are now just a year older and still require significant um, attention. Shifting over to the personnel side, uh, the Green Apple Awards. Uh, I want to thank all of our families for nominating teachers and supporting our Education Foundation with Green Apple Awards. Those will continue to be passed out during December and January. It will look a little different this year. Typically, we have all the kids get together with the teacher and they take a picture. Obviously, we can't do this this year. So uh, Megan Hewitt and myself are looking for other unique ways uh, via social media to make sure that we recognize our staff uh, for their hard work. I will tell you, as the one who personally delivers all those awards and in non-COVID times, they are so very special to our teachers and we appreciate our families, uh, not just recognize our teachers, but also our support staff as well. I want to update the board on substitutes in District 58. A number of actions have been taken to improve the situation resulting from staff absences and the shortage of substitute teachers. 
We've continued our outreach to potential substitutes and are adding new subs to our list each week. In addition, we have secured one to two floater substitutes to work at each building on a daily basis. This step has been extremely beneficial for nearly eliminating the unfilled substitute positions at our schools. We are also exploring the option of allowing instructional assistants who are properly licensed to work as substitute teachers in the event we've exhausted our options for securing coverage for classrooms on a given day. Dr. Uzentis has been working with the principals, instructional assistants, and the DGESP leadership to develop the procedures to be used in the event that we need to take this next step in securing substitute for, uh, teachers for the future. So again, a lot of hard work's taking place. I want to commend Dr. Uzentis and the building leaders and all of our staff are really working together uh, to uh, secure those substitutes. It's been a really uh, positive thing over the last month. In terms of technology, the board is aware we eliminated our squirrel um, you know, system in terms of budget reductions this year. And so uh, Dr. Eichmiller and his team put in place a new system, which always is nerve wracking when you're going into something for the first time. Uh, for parent-teacher conferences, though we concluded those last week, over 6,200 conferences were scheduled using the new system in school offices and the technology office were able to support families who needed assistance in creating a power school account and or scheduling a conference. So new system, but it worked very well and we're very appreciative of our families, our staff and Dr. Ike Miller for putting that all together because I can tell you that's always a nail biter going into a new system, making sure that it works. So uh, we, were, we were very pleased with that. Want to uh, spend some time in student services talking about new quarantine requirements. Um, as you are aware, the CDC um, has still said 14 day quarantine period is the recommendation, but they are now saying there are two ways that a quarantine period can be shortened. Uh, the first way is through testing after seven days, and the second way is through um, 10 days of no symptoms without a test. And so we're still trying to figure out exactly what impact that will have on schools. So the DuPage County Health Department sent out new information regarding these quarantine requirements based on updated information provided by the CDC. Uh, like many guidance documents and letters that school districts have received this year, uh, things are not clear exactly as to what our next steps are. Uh, this document was discussed at length this afternoon with all the superintendents and the health department at DuPage County. There's still a great deal to discuss with our team about these potential changes. And we are looking for more clarity from the IDPH. Specifically, what we're hoping the IDPH will do is update their guidance document, which talks about the exclusionary requirements. You've seen that in many presentations with the four columns. So we're hoping that they update that. I will tell you that um, District 99, District 66, several of our partner districts are looking at that 10-day quarantine uh, period. The health department has said they're not comfortable with the seven day, but they are recommending that we can switch to the 10 day quarantine uh, requirements. Um, however, 14 is still the gold standard. So we're, we're trying to, you know, piece through all that. But shortening a quarantine period, as long as it's safe to do so, would certainly benefit staff getting back into the classroom and students getting back in the classroom. I, I want to be clear, though, what we're talking about. These would be close contacts who are in quarantine, not anyone who tests positive for COVID-19. People who test positive still have to go through the 10 days and all of that. So we're talking about people who, are, who have been labeled as close contacts. Do you want to uh, spend some time also talking about temperature checks? So the governor's executive order 2020-40 filed on June 4th allowed schools to reopen for in-person instruction in phase three. In-person instruction is also strongly encouraged in phase four, which we're currently in. However, it's critical to note that this doesn't mean that things are back to normal you still have to go through many procedures. And um, so for example, guidance requires that schools conduct symptom screenings and temperature checks or require that individuals self-certify that they are free of symptoms before entering buildings. Our district is doing both. Really, you only have to do one or the other. We're doing the self-certification system and we're also checking temperatures. It's a great redundant system. We're seeing a couple things though with our temperature checks and staff have asked us, including our nursing staff, to review this practice. We're, number one, we're not catching a lot of fevers with our temperature checks. Number two, when the guidance says you should be doing this as students enter schools, the issue that you have is the weather gets colder, is you are not getting a lot of accurate temperature reads as kids come through. So no one is allowed to um, you know, go into the classroom unless they've completed the self-certification process, but now we're starting to see that the temperature checks really aren't yielding the results we were hoping for. 
And so there is talk and consideration about, as we make recommendations changing our model, that that would perhaps be something we take off uh, to get back more instructional time because we're really not seeing the benefit of that. Again, it's still up for discussion, but I wanted to mention that here today to talk specifically because, um, again, we're just not seeing the positive benefits associated with temperature checks. Please note, I'm not suggesting we, we stop the self-certification process and we're still reviewing this as well. So this is not a recommendation, it's more of just a heads up of something that we're talking about that we're um, not seeing success with in our current uh, model. Uh, to finish, just some other quick things. Winter break. All District 58 schools will be closed the weeks of De December 21st and December 28th for winter break. However, the ASC will be open December 21st, 22nd, 28th, 29th, and 30th. School is scheduled to resume for everyone on January 5th. The district will let families know on Friday, December 18th, whether schools will resume in person or take a bit of an adaptive pause. Again, we discussed that earlier. Um, District 58 has done a great deal to keep our schools open. I'd like to commend the student staff and families for all they have done to ensure strict adherence to the established safety protocols. It's a team effort. I'd also like to thank our community for taking this virus extremely seriously, especially around the Thanksgiving holiday. While the vaccine is here, we are nowhere near out of the woods. We must double down our efforts so we can keep our schools open. According to the CDC, the safest way to celebrate winter holidays is to celebrate at home with the people who live with you. Staying home is the best way to protect yourself and others. If you travel during the holiday season, I implore you to follow the CDC's recommendation and get tested prior to traveling and then again upon your return. I want to close out the superintendent's report by just celebrating all the giving that's taking place during the holiday season. District 58 is incredibly fortunate to be part of a caring and dedicated community. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen a number of efforts to support families and we're honored to be a part of them. Here's a summary of recent community efforts to help District 58 families in need. And for those of you who are listening at home, if you have any questions about any of these, whether you're in need of support or you want to support others, please call the district office. We'd be happy to hook you up with the right person uh, to make sure that um, you either get the support or you can give the support. So one of the things we have is the COVID Family Support Fund via the Education Foundation. We've raised over $12,000 for that so far and um, donations keep uh, pouring in. We have blessings in a backpack via all of our PTAs at our schools. Internet essential programs, which we're very proud of. This started here in District 58 with our county board rep, Brian Kajewski, provides uh, free internet or reduced internet to families in need. Meals and supplies via the fish food pantry here in Downers Grove. Uh, coats in winter wear uh, via the Knights of Columbus, the Moose Lodge, and the Woodridge Park District. If anyone needs a coat, hat, and gloves, we can um, get those to anyone who's in need. Uh, masks were donated by the uh, Downers Grove Junior Women's Club. We're very grateful for that. Holiday gifts have been donated uh, from the Roadrunner Soccer Club. Free meal program via District 58 and the USDA, so that will continue over uh, winter break. And winter wear and grocery gift card donations from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church as well as individual community members. Um, we are extremely fortunate to be here in Downers Grove. We know that many are less fortunate and we're here to support them not only during the holidays but also after the holidays. So if anyone knows of anyone in need, please reach out to the district office. There's a lot of things we can do uh, for families. So on behalf of all of us at District 58, we wish everyone happy holidays and please stay safe. That concludes my report. I have a question. Um, is, is the links going to be online for the, if you need help, the, all of the places that you listed and if people don't want to call the office, is there anything on the website that has any of them? Yeah, I can work with Megan. Um, a lot of what we do though is these things get dropped off at the district office and so um, we, we handle it in a couple of different ways. We contact our building principals because they are often very aware of who needs help in the particular okay. schools and so they can take care of it, but then also we will have people reach out to us as well. So okay. it's kind of an all hands on deck, but the, the easiest thing for people to do is just to contact the district office or to email Megan Hewitt. So we can certainly talk with Megan tomorrow about ways of making that more accessible for individuals. Okay. Yeah, and we always do so making sure that we keep um, everything anonymous because we know that there's a great deal of pride and, and, and we don't want to ever impose on anyone. I wanted to just make one comment about um, your report about um, notifying families and, and how we're trying to make everyone stay abreast of what's happening and giving people time with the weekends up so on um, I just wanted to mention this is my sister lives in a neighboring district 
and this made me chuckle just a little bit, but on a Tuesday night at 6 p.m., she found out that her kids were going to school the next day. So that was a very short window, and so I'm really proud of the fact that it's a lot of work for all of you guys behind the scenes, but we're allowing, giving families the amount of time that we have because in neighboring districts around us, it's not so much, and so my sister was <laughs> obviously, uh, that's a tight timeline, so thank you for your, all your team for giving as much notice as possible. No, thank you. We, we certainly appreciate that. I, I think, you know, when you roll out anything like this, um, there are certainly mistakes made. Not everything is perfect, and, and, and people can criticize, you know, many things, and probably rightfully so. The one thing we want to make sure, though, is that our communication is solid, transparent, and we get that out well ahead of time so families can make decisions. Um, and that's something that has been a point of emphasis, and we'll continue to emphasize that uh, throughout this pandemic and, and, and beyond. That's what our families deserve. So thank you for that. I just I figure it was worth sharing, considering. Yeah. I, I will tell you, you uh, I, I sometimes get calls at the district office, and people are upset with our communication and, and, and transparency and, and having they can talk perspective to my of, of multiple <laughs> districts. I, I will tell you. Uh, we get that right more than, than we get wrong here in District 58. Yes, thank you very much. Any other comments, questions? No. Thank you. All right, Todd, you're back in the hot seat with the monthly business report and treasury report. I think I used all my time up last week, so. <laughs> you did. <laughs> we let you bank some of it. Yeah. <laughs> good good self-awareness. Uh, you have the year-to-date report uh, in your packet. Um, this is uh, this is about as much revenue as we're going to have for a while. Uh, we live off of this now for the for the future. And in fact, when you get uh, the report in in January, it will probably have revenue drop because uh, we have been refunding any fees for Octo uh, for for uh, outdoor ed, uh, milk, and those other things that aren't being utilized. And um, Unfortunately, they are individual one-on-one -on -one transactions, and there were about 900 of them. And so we, our staff has uh, finally completed those in this last week or so. Uh, so you will see that December report where those have been uh, in excess of $100,000 uh, reduction in revenue. Um, you know, we may get some state or some federal money from grant submissions and so forth but the majority of our revenue uh, until that spring uh, money that we get from property taxes is, is in and, and we'll be waiting. So um, so there's that. Um, you'll see that, you know, because we've been very careful, even though we're right now running, you know, we have revenue over expenses, um, year to date we're behind a bit from where we are previously uh, last year at this time. And it is not, again, uh, an expenditure piece because we've, been able to really hold the line uh, as much as we can when you look at expenditures year to date comparison to last year at this time it is truly a revenue stream a piece and it's not just the fees piece or the you'll keep expense you know uh, revenue it is uh, the interest income the corporate personal property you know these other individual line items of revenue that uh, we've had an impact um, from this year so uh, that is really um, I have in year to date otherwise things are, are going well, as you, you know, had the in, your independent auditor uh, presentation, uh, and you know the the one uh, the couple li lines about activity funds. Activity funds until this year were considered a fiduciary fund for the district. They were other people's funds that we were the fiduciary for. Uh, the Government Accounting Standards Board, GASB, um, who <laughs> creates the rules. Uh, for accounting standards for government uh, came out with a ruling several years ago and, and put those into where they are district assets and so they are recorded and checked I mean they're audited every year and managed um, but now that they are quote unquote district assets they have to follow the same guidelines uh, that all other revenue or all other assets so we'll be working with the individual our activity funds are done by the building so we work with the secretaries and principals, uh, and we will be doing that uh, to adjust and, and give them some guidance and work through uh, how we have always operated versus how the new accounting rules require. Uh, so that's that on the audit. Um, 
you'll note that there was a, an item they, you know, the auditors do put things in there uh, about things to look for and things to watch for. Um, that's their job is to continually look for things uh, as a risk issue. And you'll see that there was some technology pieces. That's not something that is a, a requirement or what, you know, that, but it is certain something that we are working on and will <coughs> review and, uh, and take into account for the next year. Other than that, um, I do have, there's a, well, I, I have nothing else to report. Great. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Please, Todd. I have a question, Todd, about uh, on the revenue statement, there's a interest income as well behind where we were a year ago. <coughs> um, yeah. Do you mind speaking to it? Uh, yes. Interest income has dropped precipitously to the point where we, our interest account is 0 0.08 percent or 0 0.02 percent. I mean, we we essentially are not making any money on our investments at, or on on our money at this point. Uh, whereas last year we were in the two percent range, um, and it's all because the the federal it, the district is limited into what it can invest in. Obviously, uh, zero or or very little risk. Um, insured CDs, things like that, and then cash, and, and we receive uh, interest rate, uh, interest amounts on our money that is in the bank account. Um, those are always based on the federal prime rate. And as we all, and, and as you may know, the federal prime rate is as close to, or it's at zero, I believe, at this point, um, so that you know, the Federal Reserve can make sure money is available for anyone who may need it uh, in a borrowing format or otherwise. And so, as a consequence, our um, interest income has become um, a helpful piece that we that the district, I think, in fiscal year 20, ended around $300,000. Um, we will certainly not be into that that range uh, anywhere close to it this year. Um, I will say that the next, and I think we we put this in the conversation last week in the assumptions. I don't believe that we will see that type of interest rate for at least two or three fiscal years. Uh, maybe towards the end of 23 will we start to see that that come back. Um, and it will all be completely dependent on, on <coughs> the economy, what the Federal Reserve tries to do against inflation, because that's their, that's how they, they put the brakes on the economy is increase the interest rate. And so that's the, the result of it is you know, we have um, several hundred thousand dollars in, in revenue that we have had in the past that we won't be having. And then on the other end of that, that that's why we've really accelerated those conversations uh, with restructuring bonds to try and recoup some of that money on um, our, our borrowing because obviously interest rates are advantageous for the borrower as well. So that's something FAC is really looking at and we spoke about that last Monday. Yeah, and you showed that in your five-year plan. Right, kind of yeah. being low for the next several years, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Are we going to move on to our committee reports? Our first committee up is going to be the policy committee. I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Russell. So um, the policy committee, we did not meet uh, because the, there were not any uh, press updates. Um, however, this morning, we just received our new administrative procedure manual draft. That's not necessarily policy or something that makes it to the board, but it does um, coincide with our board policy. So know that that is the next big thing on the horizon for the policy committee. We'll be working through that with them and sharing with them, you know, as an admin team, how we want to make sure that we put procedures in place to align to the uh, new policy manual. And we are anticipating another update from press on the other side of winter break. And that will be uh, gone over with the policy committee as soon as we receive that. So that's where we're at with policy. But we do have a couple of policies uh, that are up for first reading mm -hmm. this week. Policies 3 colon 40, 4 colon 80, 4 colon 90, 5 colon 270, 620. 6340, 7100, 7140, and 7300. Is there anything in particular of note that um, 
It just looked like they were minor language. Yeah, I know. That's precisely what these are. So th this would have been from our last meeting in November. Um, the overwhelming <coughs> majority of the changes that you will see here are updated legal references or updated policy numbers. So nothing really of substance here. But nevertheless, um, still uh, we're recommending they just go on first reading and not for immediate approval. Uh, that way the community can review them and uh, have the opportunity to comment. Fantastic. Then is there a motion to approve for first reading policies 340, 480, 490, 5270, 620, 6340, 7100, 7140, and 7300? Place them on the January board agenda for final approval. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve for first reading policies 340, 480, 490, 5270, 620, 6340, 7100, 7140, and 7300. And place them on the January board agenda for final approval. Uh, we have a legislative committee update with uh, Member Doshi. Thanks. I'll uh, turn it over to Member Hannes first to give an update from the de Delegate Assembly that happened in the last month. So on November 14th, uh, I attended virtually the Delegate Assembly for the IASB <coughs> and we um, went through and voted on the various resolutions that we discussed in, in a prior meeting. Um, I just wanted to give a quick update just on a couple that we had spent a little bit of time talking about. Um, the first one was um, a resolution that was uh, intended to require additional training and literacy education methods, um, particularly for pre-K teachers, preschool teachers. Um, and the IASB's recommendation was not to adopt that resolution. Our res uh, recommendation as a district, as, le as a legislative committee, was to adopt that resolution. Um, that motion failed um so the the delegate assembly um chose to not require to not support that 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 resolution requiring that additional um training the other one that we talked a little bit about was um one that was related to teacher shortage and provisional licenses being um, provided for teachers in certain areas where there was a you know exceptional shortage especially in particular areas of the state. Um, that one, we also were kind of going against the IAS, IASB's uh, recommendation. They wanted to adopt that resolution. We said we did not because mostly I think our conversation relate, uh, centered around um, particular areas like special education and things like that where we didn't feel like um, provisional licenses were appropriate. And um, the initial language of that particular resolution um, did not pass. However, they did submit um, a revised version of that resolution, which if I'm recalling correctly, um, it just kind of made the language a little bit more specific towards certain um, areas of the state and certain areas of shortage. And um, that resolution of the, with the revised language did pass. So those were kind of the two that we had spent the most time talking about here that I thought I would just give a little bit of an update on, so. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll give an update from the uh, committee's discussion on the upcoming legislative breakfast. Uh, first, uh, mark uh, your calendars tentatively for February 19th uh, for the legislative breakfast. Uh, that'll be for uh, 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 Board of Education, administrators, uh, and then we will be inviting neighboring district board of, uh, boards and their superintendents. Um, that'll be uh, a morning event, uh, a legislative breakfast that delivers on the legislative and not on the breakfast, because uh, it'll be virtual. Uh, and so uh, we will, we're, we're currently discussing as a committee how to, how to organize and how to uh, focus the topics. Uh, and first in terms of organization, what, we, what we're leaning towards is doing a split event where there is a general session where the uh, entire group can meet and hear, hear from all the legislators in attendance. Uh, and then uh, for the attendees to be able to go into breakout sessions in smaller spaces with a legislator of interest, 
uh, to have more focused conversations. Each of those breakout rooms tentatively would be, uh, if we do go this route, would be moderated by one of the members of the legislative committee. Um, in terms of topic areas for uh, discussion, we're currently uh, narrowing in on these, but just to give you a, this uh, group of flavor for what we might discuss, um, a, a, few of the, a few of the topics are uh, one around the uh, recent graduated income tax did not pass uh, at the most recent, uh, at, at the polls. And with that, uh, we maintain a flat tax as a state, which potentially means that we will have a drop in funding potentially for schools, and so there's a local issue. When I say local, I mean a state issue uh, on uh, having our, our legislators share with us what we can expect uh, as uh, boards of education. Uh, another topic was uh, around state testing. State testing is still being required uh, for the end of this year. Uh, as you recall, last year that was um, eliminated from the calendar due to the pandemic. Uh, but this year it's currently on the calendars and the expectation is that those would be conducted in person, uh, which makes it difficult, obviously, in our current situation and current setup, especially with our remote learners. Uh, and so understanding what that can look like uh, and, uh, so that we can start to prepare for it as the year school year starts to come to a close. Uh, a few other topics we're, we're also talking about, but we'll finalize those as a committee um, in, uh, in next month's meeting and uh, prepare for the 19th, February 19th, for the legislative breakfast. Thank you. Any questions? Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, next up is the Financial Advisory Committee, which met on December 4th. Um, I am going to give you a little reprieve from hearing me speak uh, this month, because uh, what we did in the meeting was we were reviewing and providing feedback uh, for the, the workshop presentation that happened uh, last week, and that was the entire focus. So uh, kind of the same stuff we were discussing we focused on in last week's meeting. I do just want to take a moment once again to uh, thank the tremendous team that we have in the FAC because they provided a, a great amount of feedback. Uh, I don't know, if Steve, if you have anything to add to that? No, no nothing to add. Thanks. Appreciate it. The district leadership team did not meet, but the Health and Wellness Committee did on December 3rd. Vice President Harris. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we did meet on December 3rd, as I've had the pleasure of saying it at, at many recent uh, regular board meetings, is the, the obviously our, our, our health plans are in much, much better shape than they have been in the three and a half years I've been on the, the Health and Wellness Committee, formerly the Insurance Committee. Um, we, are remain, we continue to bring in revenue over costs. Um, so obviously just that alone puts us in a much better position than we have been in previous years. Um, you know, in the, we, you know, we pour through the data and, you know, you'll, we'll, we would see things like, for example, a big, cre big increase to prescriptions, but our rebates were realized last month, so that offsets that. Um, again, as we dig into those numbers, it reveals the need to, um, to extend a big um, thank you to the Health Wellness Committee on, on, ex on behalf of the Board of Education for some of those tough decisions that we've made over the past years that are really starting to pay off. Um, this is evidenced by our, our, our medical and RX claims being down. Um, this is um, a big part of that difference is coming from prescriptions. Um, of note, there is, um, when you compare year to date 2020 versus all of 2019, and those are calendar years, not fiscal years, we see a 28.7% decrease in our prescription costs um, based on, you know, again, realizing some some of the benefits of some big decisions that were made uh, in the past, specifically March 2019 when the board approved changes to our RX benefits. Um, large claimants, that's always been a major driver of, of, our, of our expenses as a health plan, uh, but we are, some, some of our large claimants are now um, hitting that stop, that stop loss uh, point where they're being covered going forward. So that's good news there. Um, of course, good news in terms of um, the health of the plan. Um, uh, there was a, a significant conversation about wellness, our wellness program. Um, I'm pleased to report that our participation among our staff is at 51.8%. Um, our goal is 80%, so we're not quite there yet, but we did make a pretty, we did make great progress in uh, this past, uh, this past go-around with 126 new participants. Um, our summary of wellness uh, was, was good. Um, the overall positive in terms of the health and wellness of, of these participants. 
Uh, we are, as a committee, we are um, being prepared to have conversations around uh, a phase two for offering incentives to get more of our staff to participate in the, these wellness initiatives. Um, and you know, the question might be from a board member from the community, why, why would we create these financial incentives to get our, our staff to participate in that? Um, you know, obviously, you know, when, we, when we're a cash-strapped district, why are we spending money, giving money out to, to our employees to, to participate in these programs? Well, the reason being is, of course, we all benefit from having a, a healthy and vibrant uh, staff. So there's that piece. But also, if we, can, um, if we can take care of our staff now and help them identify problems that are going to um, get bigger in the future, if we can find out now that there's a staff member who is pre-diabetic or has pre-hypertension, um, those become extremely uh, costly to, to cover down the road, but if we can stave off those, um, those big problems by helping our, our staff get healthy now and, and um, take care of themselves so they don't, their, their, their minor problems now don't balloon into bigger problems, then that is, of course, to the benefit of the staff member individually, and, and, but it also saves the, the plan a tremendous amount of money over time. Uh, for example, diabetes is extremely expensive to treat, and if we can keep our, our staff healthy, that's a win-win for everybody. And that's all from my report, unless anybody has any questions. Okay. Appreciate it, thank you. All right, we, we are now on the discussion portion. Tonight I have one item on the discussion. Uh, that's uh, on our electric rates. So I'm gonna bring Todd Dreyfall back up to the podium. Again? Tell us a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we wanted to bring this up just uh, as a quick discuss or as a discussion piece for the board um, because it's not an annual event necessarily and it's something m perhaps new uh, for many of you. Um, gas and electric are commodities that uh, the district is a large purchaser and we, we buy a lot of that. Um, we do that um, using uh, firms. Uh, we are in a gas cooperative. Um, with a variety, with a bunch of uh, DuPage County Elementary uh, schools uh, that purchase the gas uh, on, a, on a bulk uh, format uh, to help bring costs down. Uh, Vanguard Energy uh, operates that cooperative. As part of um, our relationship with them then is we also use them for bidding out electric rates uh, and then we buy and we lock in a set rate for a certain period of time. Uh, it's a bid process. Um, it is good for the day that you get the bids in uh, and you have to sign the contract on that day. Um, our, uh, we have electric rates. We're good until June of 21. Uh, but when you see uh, that there's an opportunity in the market where rates go down, uh, there's an opportunity you may want to lock in for a period of time and we are in that area of having some say, historically lower rates than what we have paid previously. And so it is advantageous to do so. Um, there's a couple ways we can do that. One, we could go to bid on the exact day of a board meeting and bring to you a resolution that night for the board to sign. The, um, the issue with that piece is if it's not a good day and they don't recommend going that day or something happens, we're stuck with what the results are, just as if you did, you know, any number of things, bonds mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, what often happens is uh, the board adopts a parameters resolution or resolution uh, giving authority either to the superintendent or to the, the assistant superintendent to sign off on the contract uh, ahead of time so that with the parameters of it's within this rates and, and so forth um, so that we work with our energy consultant to when it's an opportune time to go out into the market, get those bids from the different suppliers and negotiations, and uh, and get those rates, and then determine, you know, what the lowest rate is, uh, and and then to purchase it. Uh, one of the things we always are looking at is ensuring that we don't have a maximum or a minimum spend, because if we're in a, you know, in a hope of trying to reduce electricity, if we're replacing light bulbs with LED and hope to, you know, to see some saving pieces. We don't certainly want to pay, uh, get stuck paying for electricity we're not going to need. Um, you know, so there's some of those things. So it gets kind of complicated into that as to what the market does and, and that's where we have experts um, uh, that help and work through with that. 
And so we wanted just to bring that to the board um, as a discussion point, and then we would bring to you, uh, if it is uh, uh, your prerogative, uh, a resolution to approve uh, that format uh, that we would be able to sign a contract after after approval and give authority uh, in January, early January, you know, after the board meeting, so that we can uh, secure rates for the future uh, after that June 21st or June 2021. 20, with that, uh, I think that's hopefully what I wrote in the memo. Uh, questions? Yeah, I guess the only question I ask, what, what is the approximate spend oh. annually? You know, that's one thing I didn't go look up before I came to talk to you. So I think they would just help us kind of put it in relative terms of, like, you know, what are we yeah. talking about? T tens of thousands? I will, I, will, I will have to get that to you because I didn't look that up today. It, it is, it is con we do spend a considerable amount, I mean, Lighting is our, para is our predominant expense because we only have, so we only have a few, you know, we do have units. We have two buildings that are conditioned. We have units and portions of others. Um, but because the majority of our, our buildings are not wholly air conditioned, uh, electricity, or I mean lighting is, is a huge expense on, it, on a piece to it. But I, can, I will get that for you. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, it's somewhere in the hundred, I mean I will tell you it's a six figure number. I mean, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Everything you laid on the memo. So, uh, piggyback on Steve's question, what's the delta we'd be expecting here? Is this in the orders of you know four digits, five digits savings, or less? It, it, it's. I'm. I'm going to say. I mean, when we lock in the new rate that's lower than what we what our current lock in piece is, um, yes, we're going to save fifteen twenty. I'm hoping on an annual basis. Um, the conversations, again, everything has sort of changed this year. Um, our conversation, and, and let me let me back up. One of the first things we did um, as a team when we came in with Kevin Bardo, myself, um, and Katie was uh, any contract that had an evergreen clause, we gave notice that we were not going to continue. Uh, one, we didn't want to get locked. We may want to continue, but we want to have a negotiation and have a have a you know a, con a meaningful conversation. Some of those are two years. Some of those are service agreements that are two or three years out. Um, Vanguard was one of them, and we said, you know, not that we aren't leaving you, but we're going to have a conversation about that, and we're also going to make sure you're in your, our business. Um, they have done very well. I mean, they've they've been good at communicating and going through. Our uh, conversation prior to this year was about, um, I'm always in favor of hedging your bet a bit and buying a certain amount on, on futures, a certain amount on spot, you know, and having a blended format because you want to make advantage of those dips and not be stuck at, the, at a higher rate. Um, this year is a different year. And you can see the graph that we included. Um, it may make sense that we get a favorable future rate that is is somewhere lower, and we just say, "Look, we're going to go out 24 months because this is an anomaly. This is not something that we've seen, and it makes some sense." Um, and then we are securing that that piece going forward. Um, you know, and that would be a. A, a significant saving over the next couple of fiscal years for us, comparative to what we were, what our rate number was, uh, what we were spending before. Then, on top of that, whatever savings we have with lighting adjustment and so forth, will be included in you know into that as well. For the update this week, though, we'll provide the board with what our total electric yep. costs are, and then also what our anticipated savings are, and we'll also put that in any recommendation that we have for the uh, January meeting, though. And so just to kind of reiterate, in January it would be, the resolution would be to authorize him to be able to sign. He'd give us that, the parameter list, but it would, that way he doesn't have to, we don't have to have a board meeting on the, on right. the exact same day. Yeah. That's correct. That sounds good. <coughs> Any other discussion or questions? No. No. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Todd. You're dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
It has come to the public comment portion of the meeting tonight. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. And at this time, we'll play any public comments that we have received remotely. There are none. There are none? Okay. Hmm. All right. All right, we have uh, some minutes here. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes for the November 9th, 2020 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, uh, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the November 9th, 2020 regular meeting as presented. We have a consent agenda tonight. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. Uh, we have some action items tonight. Uh, we have no uh, board action regarding the return to learn plan. So that brings us to the fiscal year 2020 audit report. Is there a motion to accept the fiscal year 2020 audit report as presented? So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to accept the fiscal year 2020 audit report as presented. We have a couple of announcements here. Uh, Friday, January 8th at 7 a.m. will be a financial advisory committee meeting. And then Monday, January 11th at 7 p.m. will be the regular a board meeting here in Village Hall and live streamed on the um, Village YouTube channel. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees in the district? 5 ILCS 122C1. The placements of individual students into special education programs and other matters relating to individual students? 5 ILCS 122C10 and the discussions of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or a semi-annual review of the minutes is mandated by Section 2.06. That's 5 ILCS 122C21. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, right, the motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet at 8.37. So moved. All right, the board has returned to open session here at 9.58 p.m. We have one uh, action as a result of closed session. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the November 9th, 2020 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of the contents? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The meeting is adjourned at 9.59 p.m. Nice.